so nice to see so many of you. I guess we are still waiting for some people, but we're going to get started um, for the sake of timeliness. So appreciate those of you who wear a watch and check it frequently. Um, loving you tonight. So thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who have made time to attend the Lenses Ways of Seeing Buffalo and its Architecture Exhibit currently on display at the Lipsy Buffalo Architecture Center at the Olmsted Richardson campus, you know that we are attempting through both that exhibit and the speaker series to examine the core of historic preservation, traditional approaches to it, and then also push past um, some of those traditional approaches and think about um, what does preservation look like that is relevant to our modern world. And each of the speakers featured in the series were chosen for their work within that conversation as part of their ongoing practices. Um, I do want to uh, just pause for a minute and thank Melissa Brown from the Buffalo History Museum for allowing us to use this lovely space. One of the things I like the most about the Lenses exhibit is what a truly collaborative uh, effort it was. Uh, and it, you know, four Buffalo institutions coming together around um, this exhibit, the Buffalo History Museum, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, Preservation Buffalo Niagara, and the Lipsy Buffalo Architecture Center. And Jesse, I'm gonna interrupt you, but you won't say this yourself, and I haven't had a chance to do this through the whole series, but Jesse and her team have driven this whole lens project. <laughs> Thanks. So we've had a lot of fun. This has been a really great experience for us, and thanks for your great partnership. Um, so the Lenses exhibit is based on part, uh, in part on a 1940 exhibit that the then Albright Gallery put on that was curated by the noted architectural historian and art critic Henry Russell Hitchcock. And as part of his writings on Buffalo, he noted, the future ought also to provide some means of preserving the finer moments of the past instead of allowing that indiscriminate destruction which has, during the present century, removed far more excellent buildings than have been built. And of course, Hitchcock was referring to the last century, but I think some of us in this century are still waiting for when we're gonna stop that indiscriminate destruction. Um, but one thing that we wanted to bring about in the exhibit was more thoughtfulness around what constitutes the finer moments of the past. And I think it's safe to say that Hitchcock was really referring to this as an aesthetic judgment. And for many of us who got into preservation and planning and architecture, we have the same reasons. One of the things I love about living in the city of Buffalo is going outside my front door every morning and the sheer beauty that I'm confronted with um, in the built environment every day. But there are reasons to appreciate the old buildings that make it so much of Buffalo beyond just aesthetic grounds. And that is where tonight's speaker comes into the conversation. Donovan Ripkema is president of Heritage Strategies International and principal of Place Economics. Working at the nexus of heritage conservation and economic development, Mr. Ripkema has undertaken assignments in 49 U.S. states and more than 50 countries. Among recent projects include studies of the impact of historic preservation in New York and Los Angeles and recommendations for incentives for modern heritage in Abu Dhabi. Mr. Ripkema teaches preservation economics at the University of Pennsylvania, where he received the G. Holmes Perkins Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2012, and he was the recipient of the Crown and Shield Award from the National Trust. The Crown and Shield is the nation's highest preservation award and is presented for lifetime contributions in the field of historic preservation. Two weeks ago, he was here in Buffalo and toured every one of our 17 historic districts in March, a proper accomplishment in its own right. Please help me welcome Mr. Donovan Ripkema. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse, and thank you all for being out here. Um, I'm appreciative. It had been even more amazing if you would have been here when we were here two weeks ago and it was like 200 degrees below zero. But anyway, <laughs> it was like springtime here. Uh, so thank you all um, uh, for, for being here. Uh, Jesse's right. Our little firm works at the intersection of historic preservation and economics. But I say this in all sincerity. I'm not embarrassed about the kind of work that we do, uh, but in the long run the aesthetic and cultural and social and environmental, uh, symbolic, all, all of those values of historic preservation are vastly, vastly more important than the economic value in the long run. 
It's just in the short run. We often have to make the economic case so that those who have uh, the power to decide what happens, what stays and what goes, uh, can make the case. And so that's really what, what uh, uh, we're about now. Hopefully this will work. Hmm. It was working a minute ago. There we go. Uh, I do have to uh, warn you that this is a, a presentation of a lot of charts and graphs, so it may seem like the eternal economics uh, seminar. So if you doze off, uh, it's a good, good, good advantage of having the masks on is I can't quite tell if you're sleeping or not, and so it's perfectly all right. So a, a few years ago, we did a, a study for the statewide preservation organization in Pennsylvania of their uh, statewide tax credit. And we weren't quite done with the study, but they were having a statewide meeting and their executive director said, could you come up and just give us some of the factoids that you've discovered uh, so far to, to our meeting? I said, sure, we can do that. So I went and, and, and did that. And the, and the next day, I got an email uh, from one of the people who was there who said, I enjoyed your short presentation at Preservation PA the other afternoon. It was as interesting as the topic would allow. <laughs> Well, uh, so, I, so I thought, well, that's good, that's kind of high praise, and so I put that quotation on, uh, on our Facebook page, and the next day I got uh, this from somebody else who suggested maybe there was a way to kind of spice up the, spice up the report. Uh, Caitlin Cotton, our great marketing director, wouldn't let me do it, but I thought it was a good idea anyway. Uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, there was an article in Forbes, an online Forbes, very reputable uh, publication uh, called Historic Designations Are Ruining Cities. And that really came on the heels of a series of articles uh, from a variety of, of not lunatic publications, really well-regarded publications that really called into question the, uh, the value and usefulness of historic preservation. And so we kind of, in place economics, we took it on ourselves to kind of write a response. Uh, 24 Reasons Why Historic Preservation is Good for Your Community, pulling uh, from a number of the studies that we have done uh, over the last few years, uh, but most germane, I think, is about a dozen citywide studies we've done in the last few years. Some large cities, New York, Los Angeles, San Antonio, uh, Phoenix, some mid-sized places like Raleigh and Miami and Savannah, and then smaller places like Saratoga Springs and, and Cumberland. Um, but in a, in a month or two to this slide will be added uh, Buffalo, uh, because the reason that we were here uh, two weeks ago is we're beginning uh, uh, for, uh, with, with Jesse as the client, uh, a study of the economic impacts of historic preservation in, uh, in Buffalo, and we're really excited uh, about what we'll, we'll find here. So I know this is why all of you came tonight, <laughs> that, that, that you wanted to understand the concept of revealed preference. Uh, and so here's mathematically how you demonstrate it. And so those, if you grasp that now, you just go ahead and go home and we'll be all happy. Um, but there's another way to explain uh, revealed preference. And, and it's this, is that I could ask you all, who likes chocolate ice cream better? And some of you would raise your hand. And who likes vanilla ice cream better? And others of you would raise your hand. And that would be called stated preference. Hey, I like chocolate better. Or Jesse could roll in a big cart with some chocolate ice cream cones and some vanilla, and you take them. You take whichever you prefer. Well, that's revealed preference. That you, you picked up the chocolate cone revealing your preference for chocolate. Well, a lot of the research we do really looks at the actions of the marketplace and sees what their marketplace's preference is. And that's going to be a lot of what I talk to you about tonight. So I, I picked out of the kind of long list uh, a handful of things that I want to, want to share. Historic preservation is job creator. Historic preservation is tourism generator. Historic preservation is small and startup businesses. Preservation and knowledge and creative class workers. Historic preservation is catalyst. Preservation and density. Preservation of the environment and triple bottom line. And preservation is the first place of return. So just from some of these uh, studies that we've done, I want to share uh, some findings in that regard. And starting with this issue of historic preservation as a job creator. We're a preservation firm, I guess, but we're really in the business of economic development. And if you're in economic development, the core of economic development is job creation. So as a general rule of thumb, 
if you build a new building, half the money's going to labor, half the money's going to materials. But if you go in rehabilitation, 60 to 70 percent of the money goes to labor rather than materials, and that has a huge differentiating impact uh, on the local economy. So in, I gotta move this so I can read what I've written. Uh, so in the United States, uh, is, uh, 100 jobs in new construction creates 135 jobs elsewhere in the economy, but 100 jobs in, in uh, rehabilitation creates 170 or whatever the number is. So it's this labor intensity this increase of other jobs, uh, follow-on jobs from that rate, uh, the same pattern in paychecks. That there's advantage, you build a new building and there's some spin-off jobs with paychecks, but that's even greater uh, in rehabilitation. And once again, that's this issue of labor intensity. Uh, but it's not just in uh, the construction site. Uh, in our uh, study in Los Angeles, from a vibrant economy, one of the you know, great economies in the country, uh, the job growth in the city as a whole was about 15% over the decade or so we looked at. Uh, there's not very many commercial historic districts in Los Angeles, uh, but the growth rate of jobs in the commercial districts decidedly greater than the city and almost twice as much as in the, in the National Register of Historic Districts for which there's a lot of commercial. So it's this revealed preference of the marketplace uh, to locate businesses and jobs in those areas. And then of course, um, historic preservation as tourism generator. Now, I wanna be unequivocal, heritage tourism is great and we'll talk about some of the incremental benefits of that kind of tourism. But my goal in life, I'm really getting old so I gotta reach it pretty soon, is when people say historic preservation and economics in the same sentence, that the automatic response is not, oh, you must mean heritage tourism. Yes, that's one, it's a very important one, it's just not remotely the only one, uh, so we keep working on it. But uh, heritage tourism is, is a great uh, component of, of economic impact, and when you go on vacation, you spend almost all of your money in five areas. You spend it on food and beverage, you spend it on lodging, you spend it on transportation, but in this kind of analysis, we don't look at your airplane ticket to get to San Antonio. You know, that money went somewhere else. You look at the local transportation, the Uber, the rental car, the bus, whatever you took there. Um, retail purchases, and then a broad category called um, uh, entertainment, and that includes whatever you spent going to historic sites or whatever. Well, the point is, is that heritage visitors not only spend more overall, they spend more in every one of those categories of expenditures. Heritage visitors stay longer, they spend more per day, uh, they visit more places. Uh, here's Pittsburgh. Now, San Antonio might say, well, the Alamo and the World Heritage uh, Spanish Missions, of course, there's a big heritage. What about Pittsburgh? Wonderful. Uh, Re rebounding city, but we, maybe not one we'd instantly uh, leap to saying, a, saying a, a heritage place. Well, just the heritage component of Pittsburgh's uh, tourism, $800 million a year, and again, you see where those dollars flow all through uh, the economy. So the hotel, the restaurant, the retail shop, the local cab company are all beneficiaries, disproportionate beneficiaries of that heritage tourism. Uh, now, I read a, store, a study a few years ago in Norway, uh, and it said, and the study was of a visitor's expenditure, a heritage visitor's expenditure, only 6% of that goes to the historic place they went to visit. I thought, well, that's interesting. Let's, maybe we can figure out a way to look at that. So we did a statewide study in Utah, big state, uh, geographically with lots of small towns with heritage resources and so we asked that same question how much of that heritage visitors expenditures were on the site they went to visit and again the number of verses are the same about seven percent of that money and here's here's why that's significant for those of you who maybe manage or or support heritage resources or historic museums or whatever is that is that the people are coming because of you but you're not one, the one getting the money. So in Utah, where is it? Well, here's about $600 million, and who got it? $186 million to lodging, and $242 to transportation, $115 million in restaurants. Uh, $54 million ended up, of all that expenditure, $54 million went into the entertainment category, and that includes whatever they spend on those historic sites. 
So the point is those historic sites are the magnets that draw people there, but the dollars benefit much wider circle. Now, this is an, as an aside, I don't have a slide on it because just yesterday I did the numbers. We have in our firm, every month or so, we do a thing called a Prez poll, a poll on preservation issues. And we do it on our Facebook pages, on a, on a mailing list we have, and it's virtually all preservation professionals. And this one was about what are the best American historic cities to visit? And we divide it by city size. Well, Buffalo falls in the toughest category in that the, we, had, we said 500,000 and over, 50,000 to 500,000, 10,000 to 50,000, under 10,000. Those were our size categories. Well, Buffalo uh, falls into the category with Charleston, with Savannah, with Santa Fe, but Buffalo came out in the top 10 of more than 70 cities I mentioned as pre preservation professionals saying these are the best historic cities to visit. So congratulations on that. Uh, then historic preservation and small and startup businesses. Now I'm a, I'm a market economy guy, but my, you know the giants can take care of themselves. My real concern is small business. What is small business doing? What are the revealed preferences of small businesses? So here's Nashville. Again, a very vibrant, maybe overheated economy. 3% of all jobs are in the historic districts. And again, there's not very many commercial historic districts in Nashville. Uh, but 11% of the job growth, 13% of the startup jobs, 15% of all small business jobs are in that historic, those historic districts. The revealed preference of small businesses to be in that area. Uh, here is uh, San Antonio and the purple areas are historic districts. The green circles are jobs in small firms. And by small firms, we say those employing 20 or fewer people. Uh, and what you can see is, is the pattern. It's not that every one of them are in historic districts, but this pattern of concentration. I want to be in or close to where that preservation because it's the character of those places, uh, sometimes the walkability, a wide range of things, but there is this magnetic attraction of historic buildings, of, of uh, historic neighborhoods uh, to small businesses. Now again, LA does not have very many commercial local historic districts. What we call historic districts, they call HPOZs, Historic Preservation Overlay Zones. So all, of all the jobs, there's only, there's less than 2% of all the jobs in those local historic districts, uh, but over 4% of the startup jobs are in those local historic districts in Los Angeles. And then it's not just jobs in general, but particularly jobs in two job categories. And that is jobs in the knowledge industries and knowledge in the creative class uh, industries. Uh, that again, there's this revealed preference. So here is Indianapolis. Uh, in the uh, historic districts cover about 3.5% of the land area of uh, Indianapolis about 16% of the jobs, but 28% of the jobs in the core knowledge worker basis, professional services, uh, scientific technical services. Those are the knowledge geek guys, differential preference to be in a historic district. Uh, here is this, we did a statewide study in uh, Rhode Island. And again, about less than 4% of all the jobs are in historic districts, but professional scientific educational services, uh, uh, management of corporations, and importantly, the kind of arts entertainment, the core of the creative class disproportionately choose to be in historic districts. And then your sister big city in the state of New York, New York City, people can love New York or you can hate New York, but nobody can argue it's not one of the most creative cities in the world. And yet, here's what happens. In Manhattan, historic districts in Manhattan have about 12.5% of all the jobs, but 28% of the jobs, creative class jobs. But it's not limited to Manhattan. If you take all of the boroughs, uh, the same pattern, that historic districts have whatever, 8% of all of the jobs, but twice that amount in the creative class jobs. It is the revealed preference of those kinds of, of industries. Now, it's not that the creative class or knowledge worker jobs are the most important, but those are two job categories that really drive a local economy, that bring other things, uh, both uh, fiscal and non-fiscal, to a community. And so this preference of those kind of workers, and, the, and it's not that the businesses are choosing, it's the businesses are saying, what do my worker, what do my workers want to be? particularly in those categories, and they're choosing those locations because that's where their workers uh, want to be. 
And then the issue about historic preservation as catalyst. That often when we have historic preservation projects, it's the trigger to make other things happen. So we've looked at that in a number of places, and sometimes we do it more on the soft side, interview side, uh, than data. And so Pittsburgh, and if you haven't been in Pittsburgh in a number of years, you ought to go. It's one of the great comeback cities in America. And we talked to, to Jeremy Waldrop, who runs the downtown organization, and he'd say, what's your success attributable to? He said, historic preservation has been key to the growth of downtown. There's Baton Rouge, capital of Louisiana. Their core, I think it's Third Street, but the core, kind of what we would call the main street in their downtown, was in spite of the, you know, both the state government and a big university there, was really a dead place until they started doing small scale projects, uh, uh, building on each other in the downtown core. And you can see the pattern of change over a six or seven year period, uh, driven a lot by the state tax credit in Louisiana that they layer on top of the federal tax credit. Uh, but it's the most vibrant place now, without question, in, uh, in Baton Rouge uh, because of the historic preservation work that took place down there. Here's one of my other favorites, uh, Miller's Court, former industrial building in the very heart of Baltimore, a city that's still losing in population. Uh, nothing, nothing had happened in that neighborhood for years until Miller's Court, that was a residential development geared toward teachers and other public employees. Uh, and it just made a huge difference, not only in Miller's Court, but that encouraged investment around Miller's Court. So while the city of Baltimore, when the, over the period we looked at, still declined in population, the area around Miller's Court, in fact, uh, bloomed in population. Uh, a different study we did in Baltimore, they have a city property tax credit. And so we looked at the properties that had used the tax credit, and then we looked at the change in value within 1,000 feet and 500 feet of those projects. Now, of course, if somebody used a tax credit, they invest in their building, of course the value of that property is going to go up. But what about the stuff nearby? Well, you see this, this halo effect that this preservation project happens and enhances the value of the properties uh, all around it. And then this maybe is my favorite example. Here is uh, Rouse's Market in New Orleans. And this isn't one of the cool neighborhoods you think about the French Quarter, the Garden District, New Orleans, it's just another neighborhood where literally, literally nothing, zero happened in the 10 years after Katrina. Nothing happened until some guy bought Rouse's Market, bought a former automobile dealership, 1950s building, converted into Rouse's Market, a kind of high-end uh, grocery store. Uh, and subsequent, and not, look at the chart, nothing happened until Rouse's market happened and then $140 million was of investment. And we talked to the developers and said, why would wh you make the, the investment here? And they said, because of Rouse's market. Most of this was in fact on vacant lots, just sitting there empty. And this was mostly new construction on those vacant lots uh, catalyzed uh, by uh, Rouse's market. Every city, large or small, uh, deals with issues of density. And density is kind of a weird word because the transportation planners, the infrastructure planners, the city urban planners, all, everybody will say, we gotta have density and make this stuff work. And the, everybody likes it except the public who says, if I wanted the density, I'd move to New York, I want that damn density stuff. Well, we just have to kind of step back for a, for a minute. Is that what we're seeing in historic districts is not density, but density at a human scale. It's density that people say, oh, this is the kind of neighborhood I want to live in. Well, you know what? You're picking the places, in fact, that have among the highest density in the city. Uh, here is uh, Indianapolis, where you see the density in the historic district is about a third more uh, than in the city as a whole. Now, some of you may know uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis has a consolidated government that fills the whole county, so there's a whole bunch of farmland and stuff within the city boundaries, but that would be an unfair comparison. Of course, the historic district bone density. No, we just took urban, urban uh, Indianapolis and made the comparisons and decided to create a density. Uh, here's Los Angeles, not a place known for its density, but the density in historic districts is twice the density that it is in other residential areas in Los Angeles. Uh, here's Raleigh. At the beginning of the 20th century, Raleigh had a population of about 8,000 people per square mile. And then comes the automobile suburban expansion, you see it just crashed. And so it, it ends up with about 2,800 people uh, per square mile. But look at this. 
the local historic districts have a density twice that of the city as a whole. We're getting density in historic districts, but it's density at a human scale, and you certainly have, and one of the issues we'll look at here in Buffalo is density, and you certainly have it here in historic districts. And of course, you read the New York Times, the Real Estate Board of New York says, oh, the stupid historic districts, we gotta grow, we gotta build new buildings, and historic districts are killing us, and we we're, we're, don't have any affordable housing because all those historic districts. And, well, so we looked at all of the historic districts, all the local historic districts in New York, 93% of them have, in fact, a density greater than the average density in the city as a whole. And 1%, 1% of the low density areas in uh, New York, all five boroughs, 1% of that is in historic district. 99% is somewhere else. Our response to the real estate, well, I'm pro real estate development, it's a background I come from. But you know, if you're not, the historic districts cover about 5% of the land area of the city of New York. You know, maybe if you're not smart enough to figure out how to develop in the other 95% of the land, maybe you're not smart enough to be developing in New York City. Um, and then this emerging issue uh, that's gotten a lot of, internationally, a lot of new looks in the last decade or so, and that's this relationship between historic preservation and the environment and the kind of triple bottom line measurements of not just economic returns, but also environmental and social returns. This study we did in uh, Rhode Island. We, I, I'm an I'm, uh, unapologetic thief of methodologies, and in, in uh, Maryland, there was an investment banker who had done some of these preservation economic studies before, who teamed up with environmental economists, and they decided to say, well, w w what are the differences if we, if we uh, do a rehabilitation project and we go to the edge of town and bring a new one? So we just stole their methodology. Here was a building in downtown Providence that had been uh, rehabilitated. So uh, we said, all right, what if a building of that side, they decided that whatever we're gonna use that building for, we put it at the edge of town and build it instead. What are the environmental differences? Well, in, in CO2 emissions, in vehicles on the road, in, in whatever, in land use. In fact, decidedly more environmentally responsible action, uh, rehabilitating. You know, I, I often argue that the, the Sierra Club and the kind of taxpayers union people ought to be holding hands and leading the preservation parade. Because whether you're arguing on the fiscal side or on, arguing on the environmental side, in fact, historic preservation is the better uh, alternative. Philadelphia well, every Tuesday I, in the spring I go up, teach my class, take two students to lunch and take the train back to Washington, but I read the newspaper and I remember when the 2010 census came out, big headlines, we finally turned the corner, we've been losing population for 50 years and now we're finally growing again, not much, but at least we're growing, we're not declining, except they were wrong, the historic districts grew by 12,000 people, the rest of the city still losing population. And then Washington, where I live, again, long, 50 years of population decline and then a turn. Where did people go? Disproportionately, they went to historic districts, not the city as a whole. Disproportionate share went to historic districts in Washington. And Boston, who turned the corner of, you know, sometimes Boston is such a vibrant place, we forget that it was also in a long period of economic decline. It turned the corner a decade earlier than Washington or, or uh, uh, Philly, uh, but with the same pattern, that 22% of the people live in historic districts in Boston, but that's where 36% of the growth took place. If cities want to position themselves to grow in population, for God's sake, then keep the historic districts because that's where people are going to want to go back to. So I want to want to end with this it's an economics lecture uh, from one of the great American uh, economists, John Kenneth Galbraith. He said, the preservation movement has one great curiosity. There is never retrospective controversy or regret. Preservationists are the only people in the world who are invariably confirmed in their wisdom after the fact. Thank you all very much.